Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Maryland Department of Labor Virtual Training Institute. I am so honored and pleased to be here with Raquel Francis, ESL instructor from Montgomery College. Before we get underway, I'm going to launch a poll just to see who's in the room with us. <clears throat> so if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment to complete the poll. Okay, it looks like we're getting pretty close to completion. Just another couple seconds. Okay, I'll go ahead and end and share out who we have. Um, largely uh, instructors, which is great. Um, instructional specialists, program administrators, and other. Welcome to all. Um, again, I am I am so pleased to be here with Raquel Francis, ESL instructor from Montgomery College. Raquel, take it away. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Welcome. Happy Valentine's Day. I'm happy you decided to share it with me. So let's go ahead and jump in. So what we're going to focus on today is, uh, once my slideshow starts, we're doing a presentation called Show What You Know, sort of a comprehension check and focusing on PowerPoint activities and how we can use those in the remote classroom. Before we jump into the details, these are my own opinions and the contents in here do not necessarily reflect an endorsement or the views of the Maryland Department of Labor. They are mine, but I am so happy they gave me the space to share with you guys today. So there are just three main objectives that I hope we can hit together over this next 50 minutes. First, five simple PowerPoint activities that you can use to informally assess your students. Um, and also they're engaging and I find students want to participate in them. The second is thinking about technology considerations that would require us to give students alternative forms of participating. And finally, just thinking broadly about the subjects we teach, how could we incorporate some of these activities in the classroom, okay? So let's start with the why. At the beginning of the pandemic, my first remote class, I was thinking, ooh, this is great. Adult ed, I finally will always have the ability to share videos, show my screen, and I love technology. But in thinking about that, I then started to think about the context that I had noticed with the students over the years. And while I love technology, I decided I need to be very selective with the tools that will allow me to focus on instruction, but also consider students' ability as well as access. So the first thing I did is chose PowerPoint. Why? It is commonly used whether through institutional accounts or our personal accounts. And while I also love Google products, when it comes to slides, it's not as robust in terms of what you can do and create um, in it, in terms of animations to really add that extra pop. The second thing is my program uses Zoom. And so I wanted to take advantage of as many features that were available simply so the students wouldn't have to navigate outside of the program while we were in class. Next. At the beginning of the pandemic and still, I do have students that come to class with a smartphone. And when I was in person and would try to have fun apps and things in class, sometimes students simply did not have the storage space on their phone for a new app, as well as they did not really know how to navigate 
their phone as well, some of them. And then finally, there are a wide range of digital literacy skills. And as our students rate, range in age from Gen Zs to Gen Xers and sometimes boomers, I understand there's a difference in cognitive load in using technology. So I wanted to focus on what would be the simplest and engaging for all of those groups. And so that's why I chose these two tools. PowerPoint for the triggers that I can use to control when something appears, disappears, be emphasized, right? And then timers to automate the processes a bit so I wouldn't have to be clicking all the time. And then of course, Zoom's interactive features, you've already seen one today, polls, which can include single choice, multiple choice. And if everyone uses the updated devices, you can do quizzes similar to Google Forms. You have private chat messages, public ones, as well as the ability to annotate or write on the screen. So as we get into it, um, Ramona, can we go ahead and launch the first poll? I want to see what everyone's background is using Zoom. Okay, um, Raquel, I don't see an additional poll in our in our polling system. Um, oh, do you mind if I just consult with Ahu who coordinated and can we come back to it by any chance? Um, for this one, we will. I'll just shift the order of the presentation a bit then. My apologies. It is integral to it. But for now, um, would you guys mind, can you just quickly type in the chat box? One thing, do let's this is the beauty because this also happens in classes sometimes so just do me this favor these are my questions do re, in regards to zoom do you know how to use the chat feature yes or no right okay awesome the second question, do you know how to use the annotate feature? Okay, good. Wait, so we, I have a couple of no's and a couple of yeses, okay and think but need to learn more good no you use teams okay this is great so there's a wide range of abilities which zoom which is understandable and that's basically the same thing that happens in my class so good so with that let me go ahead i'm going to clear the screen and i'm going to change the order of what we do for a bit um, since the polls that actually I will still be able to do it. It will have that polling feature, just not in today because it's not added into the webinar. So let's jump into our first activity. This is called A or B. This activity comes from a wonderful, wonderful um, website from an instructor called Technologic. And he, kind of, he designed some of the activities in this presentation today. And some others were designed by me um, as I was inspired by him. So A or B, you can think of it as the digital version of the classical activity, Vote With Your Feet, where you have the students move from one side of the class room to the other to show what their response is, but in digital form, okay? 
So they choose between two answer options, A or B, from a question prompt. It's good for assessing anything that's commonly confused, whether you're using it for pronunciation like minimal pairs or different words, things like that. The Zoom features that are typically used is the poll. Now, since our poll is not open, all I'm going to do for this activity is ask that you vote A or B for the answers. Okay, so this is the first one. Which coin is a dime, A or B? Great, so you would get this, you would launch your poll, the students would vote A or B, and then the most popular answer seems to be A, so let's check, is it A? It is A, and that is correct. Awesome, good. Let's go and practice with another one. Which sentence is the evidence for the claim below? The workplace is unsafe and unhealthy. Someone can fall or the ladder is broken. Okay. Very good. So I see the majority of the answers coming in. So you choose whichever one is the majority and it's B. So again, in the classroom, you can typically combine this with Zoom polls to have students participate that way. And just as happened here with us a moment ago, if students are having difficulty, responding via polls, you can then have them use an alternative form to respond, such as this with the chat box. So this is A or B. So we've seen this use two examples, one that's visually based and the second that is text-based. I want you to take a minute or two, think about what you typically teach and write what is one topic that you could use this for in your classroom. I use the examples of a lesson about money and this one was about claim evidence and reasoning. So what could you do? So a specific topic from what you teach. Let's take a minute. So math, okay, Linda, in math, is there a specific topic? Present perfect to past tense, good. Homophones, civics government, vocabulary, identifying fractions, parts of speech, verb, noun, that's a good one. Language arts, grammar, passive voice. Good, so as you see, it's a simple activity. Students, they usually love the voting and the suspense to before they guess whether or not they're right. And then they start doing similar to you, just getting in there and participating. Good, Co complete sentence, sentences versus fragments. I haven't done that one yet, but I will definitely be using that idea. Good, good. So let's go ahead and move on to the second activity. So this one is called Pair Up also from Technologic. Pair up, basically you have one common theme or one common question and about eight different options. Some of them fit that theme or options and others don't. So that's the point of this activity. Typically, I use annotate and chat, depending on, so, uh, one, one moment, I'm going to a question, going back one moment, the question, do we use the chat feature to act as a poll with the PowerPoint images? I'm so confused. So Melanie, to answer your question, you can use the polling feature. Today, as happens with technology sometimes, 
it doesn't work out the way that you want it to. As an alternative, you can use the chat to conduct a poll, but if the polling feature is available, it's much more quicker to see how many of your students have responded to close and have how many people voted for what an easy count without having to do extra work. So polling is the preferred feature to use with this activity, A or B. But if you are in a pinch, you can use the chat feature as well. Okay. So pair up. Already described what it is, and we typically use chat or annotate. Now, most people said that um, they're familiar with the features, but just in case you are not, if you need help with chat, if you're on a computer, easy to access, it's usually at the bottom. If you're on an iPad, you choose the three dots at the top, chat will come down. If you're on the a phone, the three dots are at the bottom and select chat. So you can choose the next activity to respond via chat if you would like. If you choose to practice using the annotate feature, if you're on the computer at the top of your screen, you're going to see where it says you're viewing Raquel Francis's screen. You're going to see view options next to it. As long as you're using a computer and not a Chromebook, the a little down arrow, and you'll see the option to annotate. Once there, you have all of these features. The easiest one will probably to use the stamp and the check mark, okay? If you're on a phone or tablet for this webinar today, go ahead, tap your screen so you see the little, where you see the pencil in the blue circle. You click it, click your pen, choose your pen. You can change your color if you want, and then just write a check mark on the screen. Okay, so let's get into the activity. So this activity, check the boxes with the same meaning as the underlined word. You can choose if you want to respond via using annotate or the chat box. If you're using the chat box, simply type the number of the word that's a synonym for fake. Okay. Okay. So I see some responses are coming in via the chat box. So usually as my students are doing this, if they can't participate during annotate, I'll literally just be checking them for them on the chat box. One, six, seven, five, five, seven, one. Okay, you don't see annotate. So if you're on a Chromebook, annotate is a function that does not work on Chromebook whatsoever. And I'm not sure why, 175. Okay, so you would continue to do this the whole time with your students going through to whichever point you say, okay, now let's stop, right? and then we check our answers together. So when you're ready to check your answer, you go through each of these and then reveal whether or not they're correct. So false, dirty, no, wrong, genuine, no, okay? And then you discuss the answers. If there's any confusion, these are great opportunities for discussion and everyone learns from them. Let's try another one. Let's clear again, which of these are appropriate small talk topics in the US?
Okay. Two, two, four, six, eight. Okay. So it looks like many people are choosing the similar thing. Okay. Good. And again, the same thing. Once you've decided you've given your students enough time, go ahead and click to reveal the correct answers. So this is one, I think, the last time I used this was back in November. So the great thing about this, it's easy to update any of these to include um, current events and things that are happening to make it relevant to the um, students. Okay, and this is pair up. Now, similar to the last activity, I want you guys to take a minute and think, what specific topics could you use this for? Did I create this in Word? No, all of these are PowerPoint based, uh, Marissa. So go ahead and type in the chat box, hmm, what topics could you use with this type of activity. So we've seen synonyms and we've seen uh, cultural topics such as this. Adjectives versus adverbs, awesome. Identify main idea, countries, grammatically correct sentences. Oh, organizing history of American wars. Ooh, Bill of Rights, poems like haikus. Awesome. So again, it's a simple activity, but it can be used for many different topics. Good. Way of adding numbers, choose the correct answer. Yes. Good. So let's go to our third activity. So this one is Kim and Wright. This one um, is one that I created at a time because I wanted to focus on helping students develop some of those pre-reading, not pre-reading skills, um, fast reading skills, okay? So basically, you can use this with either imagery or text. The students observe it for a short period of time, then write a response based on the prompt, okay? Typically, I do use chat and poll, but it seems a chat is the only feature that's working today. So I'll just quickly adjust it for that. But again, you can use this with the polls. Um, so this is what will happen, okay? You're going to skim the images for eight seconds. Then in the chat box, I want you to write a title that describes the main idea of the group of images. It is only going to be eight seconds and I do not repeat it if someone said, oh, I missed it. No, the idea is for them to focus on that quick reading and interpreting of information. So I kind of give a countdown to get them ready. So get ready guys in three, two, one. Now go ahead, write a title that describes the main idea of that image sequence you just saw. Okay. So as you are typing in the chat box, right? I would then go to the students and start putting in A, B, C, copying some of their responses, right? So job interview seems to be a popular one. And if uh, one of the Titles is repeated multiple times. I usually just put it once. So this one is a little bit more active on your part as a teacher, simply because 
um, there is no way to get, there is a way to get students to type directly into the slide, but I try to avoid that confusion and frustration for both of us <laughs> um, in the classroom. Okay, so here are three options. So now that I've taken the suggestions from the students, there's two ways to make this box disappear. I click the I icon, I added an extra trigger so it stays open. And I ask that, okay, students, now vote which ones do you think are great titles for the complete groups of pictures? It may be, oh, I think this one is really good, or this one only seems to describe just one or two of the pictures, not everything together, right? So preparing for a day for an interview or work, job. So I'll ask you to vote, which one sounds like great? Titles for the complete group, B, preparing for a day for work, and the interview, and so on. So you would say A or B, and then I say, okay, does A match for all of the pictures and not just a portion? And we go from there and practice, okay? Very good. Good. And when we're finished, I can always just click the I again to close it. Awesome. Let's practice again now using this, but with text. I usually do multiples of these in a row. And a quick tip is I use the same color, but I literally just go down different shades in the gradient. So I know where I am <laughs> in terms of which image I'm going to show them or text prompt. Now, this one, you'll have 25 seconds. I usually give my students more, but you guys are all proficient English uh, speakers and users, so you only get 25. So you will have 25 seconds, skim the text, write a title that describes the main idea. In three, two, one, go. Okay, and I see answers are coming in. So there are a lot. <laughs> you guys are fast. And 25 seconds seems very slow. Okay, so again, after the 25 seconds, it would automatically close and you would then go, okay, here are the options. What do you think is a useful title? I'm only going to do a few simply for the interest of time, okay? And this is bigger than my typical class size. So again, there we go. I would then say, here we go. We These are our options. My students usually take the whole time to skim. Then they type in, we have a moment, it's closed. Then I reopen it and say, which vote, which ones, are good titles for the text, right? Okay, so we have writing an email, how to write a professional email, writing an in-house email for work, email rules, how to properly construct an email. So all of these are phenomenal ones. So you can, I would usually use a poll and it would be a multiple choice poll where I would just do the maximum number of slots that Zoom polls allow, which I believe is 10. 
answer options and just use 10 answer options and we discuss it together as a class. And so this is skim and write. But awesome, thanks everyone for being such active participants today. So similar to the other activities, I want us to take a moment, stop and think, hmm, we've seen this used for skimming with both images and with text. What are some possible topics, thinking about the courses you teach, that you could use this activity for? Go ahead and type your responses in the chat box. Prescriptions. Oh. Interesting. Math recipes. Awesome. Driver's license manual. Good. Short reading of a passage, preparing for classes, teaching grammar. Awesome. These are all amazing ideas. And the reason I'm asking you to think about this is so you start jotting those ideas down. So if you want to use this in class tomorrow, later on today, whenever you have that already done, how to secure a passport, writing an essay. Amazing. Good. So let's go ahead to the fourth activity. This one is also based on a reading skill because for a while I was on a reading skills obsession. And this one is how to preview. Okay. Similar to the last activity, but a little different. So they're going to usually do two things, find and underline useful pre-reading information, then answer questions based on the finding. Typically, I use annotate and then decide on based on the day and student devices whether we use chat or polls, okay? So how this activity works, under this yellow square is a text. The students, would then use the annotate feature for 45 seconds to just put a line under the types of information they would look at while previewing. So this does two things. By having them annotate, I, can, I am checking, do they actually understand what the different textual um, text-based features are like title, subheading, what bold, italics, and the different things like that are. Are they pointing out those first sentences in the paragraph, looking for main ideas, things like that, okay? So we're not gonna wait the whole 45 seconds because it's a lot, but it would be 45 seconds. They would go ahead, they would annotate. I know we're having um, some issues with annotation today, but they would annotate, a lot of students would go in and they would put in lines under things like these, right? And then once the red, not red, it was yellow, <laughs> then after that time is finished and the yellow box comes back, I'm drawing one in simply because I am impatient to wait and you guys are fast. The box comes back, and at that point, I reveal the comprehension questions. I ask a volunteer, can you read the questions and the answer options? If the poll feature is working, you then have them vote A, B, or C. Since ours is not working today, we will use the alternative response form, which is the chat box. Can you type? Which answer is correct? What is the title of the article? Is it A, B, or C? Go ahead and type in the chat box. Which answer is correct? Okay. I have one answer so far. Two, okay. Okay. Good. So I have a couple of B's, I have a couple of C's. 
So once you have given your students enough time to respond, then you say, okay, the correct answer is B. Because the first thing you should always read is the title. <laughs> then again, we go to the next question. So does that, did anyone get the answer for this one? What skills were mentioned? These were the little subheadings. Okay, I see a couple of answers. I see C's, A, a lot of C's. And after the amount of time, you go ahead and you then reveal the answers. It was C. So it did, you probably said A because it mentioned communication skills, but it wasn't simply talking about speaking skills. It was communication. Good. Ooh. Let's go back. Now, take a moment as we've done with the other activities and decide what other topics could you use something like this for? So go ahead and type your responses in the chat box. Directions, okay. If I see directions, I'm assuming like there would be a map or there would be a word problem. Ooh, supporting details in a reading, reading comprehension. Very nice, good. So it really does offer the flexibility for multiple things. And if you want to give your students more time or less time, you can also do that. Good, so we're going to move on to the final activity, again, from my reading skills phase, um, which are predictions. So again, writing predictions and checking their accuracy. This I typically use the annotate and chat box feature. We will just go ahead with the um, chat box today. So what it is, we just previewed uh, a reading called Keys for Success at Work, right? So we would go and start, okay, students, what did, do you remember from the preview, right? At this point, I would typically exit my PowerPoint. As you see, there are some underlying things. And this is exactly what I would do in my classroom. I exit the PowerPoint simply because it's faster to type and organize this way versus doing it through Zoom, okay? and response alternatives is gone. So I would, what did we remember? We know the title, it mentioned communication skills, um, problem solving skills, and anything else the student remembers, we're speaking through this portion. Then I would ask my students, okay, go ahead and type one prediction you have about the information that would be in the text based on what we remember from the preview. And even though they've already seen the text, the preview is normally so short for them that they can't really do a deep reading. They're just, again, going over the top to get those key pieces of information to get an idea of what it's about. So then they would go in and write additional predictions. I would go ahead, they type it in the chat box, right? If anyone wants to type a prediction in the chat box, go ahead and do it now. I would add it to the screen. And I like to make sure that there are numbers on the screen. Again, 
as an alternative form in the chat box when we are working together, right? I think they're going to talk about, talk about um, finding information on the internet, internet or something. Okay, so once that is finished, we've collected all of our predictions. I turn that back on and I go back into the PowerPoint. At this point, I got tired of <laughs> annotating my screen how they should respond. So I just, again, put a secondary trigger on there and told students, these are their three, these are the ways they can respond. If they're using the annotate feature, the predictions are 100% correct. Put a check mark on the line, anywhere in the line, for that prediction. If it's part of it's correct, part of it's not, squiggle, not correct, X. If they're participating in the chat box, they would just put the number of the predictions and type either C, squiggle, or X. Okay? Sometimes they put a dash as well, because I think they don't know where to find the squiggle on the keyboard, and I accept that as well. So what happens next, I click my trigger to close this, and we listen to the audio. We listen to the whole thing, and we check our predictions. Then we go through and decide, okay, do you heard this? Was it, did it have the idea or is it just completely not mentioned at all? And we go through these one by one, all before we read, then they actually do the close reading and answer those comprehension questions that are in their books. And that is the predictions activity. Similar to the other activities we talked about, I want you to take a moment to go ahead and just type, what other possible topics do you think something like this would be good for? Are there any other topics? Success in a class, okay. The weather maybe, okay. Goals, it's a good one. Resume, that's a good one as well. So I love how the topics are so varied. I see the question about the templates. I'm waiting to answer it at the end. I've seen it, relax, relax. <laughs> Okay, assisting fellow co-workers. Good. So that concludes the five different activities that I wanted to show you. There are many more that I use, just again, in the interest of time, I think these had the most application of what's in my activity toolbox. So that was A and B, the first one, pair up the second one, um, skim and write the third one, preview, the fourth, and this final fifth one, predictions. So one of the things to think about are potential barriers to participation because they do exist. One is, this is through a lot of trial and error, the Chromebooks do not have compatibility for the annotate feature. So if you are giving a student an activity and one of the typical response options is to annotate, think of ways that you could include for them to participate via the chat box. Annotating, I like to leave to short, um, short marks or short things, simply because if someone is annotating from a phone, it is much more difficult to do a longer sentence because they're using their fingers typically to write. And finally is 
there are students that will be using Zoom for the first time or they have used Zoom, but they have this fear and aversion to technology because they're afraid they're gonna break something and do something wrong. For something like that, I highly recommend having something similar to what I had right here, right? Where you do go through step-by-step step how to use those different features. Because I have this as a backup at the end of my, all my presentations in class, simply because in those first few weeks, students will definitely be asking the same thing over and over again. And it never hurts even the most advanced students to see it multiple times, okay? With that, I am getting to you what you've been finally waiting for. No, you do not have to create these templates from scratch. A and B and pair up are available at this website along with about 18 other PowerPoint activities that you can adjust and use for class. The second one for the ones I've created um, are available at this tiny URL link. You can download it and within the PowerPoint presentation itself, there are slides with videos that walk you through how to edit and customize the information to your liking, as well as a review of where to click during the presentation to reveal um, those hidden aspects of the PowerPoint. Okay? And just as a final thought, one of the things I like about these activities, especially A and B, pair up, um, skim and write, and predictions, is that you can also move it to the in person classroom. But instead of using Zoom features, they may be writing on paper or walk into different sides of the rooms to show their responses. So let me address some of the questions I've been seeing in the chat box. So the first question, um, having a templates that instructors can customize would be helpful. You now have that. So technologic. A and B, those are from there. The second batch, skim and write, preview, predictions, those are the ones that I created. Um, are these free? Yes, that's my favorite word as a teacher. Can you put these links into the chat? Yes, give me one moment and I will do that for each of them. Uh, what else? I'll open the floor to anyone that has questions. Are there any other questions? No? Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Rick. I'm just uh, copying them because I think they might have just gone to the host and, and panelists. So I'm putting them in for oh. everyone. But I mean, it's the very least I can do after <laughs> okay. all, all of the. Um, clearly, you're very adept at delivering this presentation because, you know, you were able First to pivot. Time. <laughs> Whoa. Because you're able to pivot so nicely. And, and it's clear that you're implementing it well in your classroom, these strategies, because you're anticipating all of that, you know, could have gone wrong and, and whatnot. Um, so I do apologize as everyone's considering your evaluation, you know, none of the technological challenges had anything to do with Raquel. So just keep that in mind when you're completing your evaluation, we apologize for those profusely. Um, yeah, and we just really appreciate your steadfastness to digital, including digital literacy in the classroom, despite, you know, when, when technology stops um, being nice in the sandbox, so. And thank you everyone for your graciousness, particularly Raquel for being so gracious and uh, presenting. Thank you guys for having me. Have a wonderful rest of Valentine's Day. Enjoy. Thank you.